it can be argued that our current elastic debt money is backed by real value, every bit as meaningfully as gold. That's because money, most of which is created as mortgages, represents the value of the assets pledged as collateral. So is bank credit money actually a claim on the real estate pledged to create it? Not directly. Bank credit money can be a claim on anything. Now anything includes the real estate pledged as collateral. So it can be a claim on the real estate that was pledged to create it. So how is a promise of real estate any less valid than a promise of gold? Both gold and real estate can change value relative to other commodities. Neither is a permanent standard. In fact, there can never be a permanent standard of value because value is always subjective and variable. So it would seem that the crucial difference between a claim on gold and bank credit is that bank credit is not a claim on any specific real thing, while the promise of gold is. The promise of gold has to be a promise of a specific amount of a specific real thing from a specific promiser. Isn't that the essential reason why many people would consider a promise of gold the better promise? But that is only true if the promise is reliable and what is delivered is really gold. With the discovery that some of the gold bullion sitting in central banks is actually relatively worthless tungsten plated in gold, the whole argument that gold is the most solid, reliable money is shown to be neither solid nor reliable. Precious metal is susceptible to counterfeiting, it's heavy, and it's vulnerable to theft. So to return to commerce via the physical exchange of precious metal coins would mean civilization had reverted to a pre-electronic level of technology. In the absence of such a collapse, the economy would still wind up running on promises just as it does now. So once again, money would only be as good as the promises made, and there would be no need of actual precious metal coins if all transactions were carried out with promises. The fundamental question is, what does the need for money to enable trade have to do with the amount of some shiny metal there is, or the amount of any single natural resource or commodity, or real estate for that matter? Where is there any meaningful relationship between the functional need for money and any of these things? To answer that question, let's go back in time and find out when money started and why it became what it is today. We know that Stone Age people had money. In the Stone Age, before writing was invented, money had to be a portable object of value, because that was the only technology available. That's why rare shells and stones from which jewelry could be made were ideal as money. A rough standard of value for these money objects developed over large areas, enabling extensive networks of indirect trading. This way people could obtain specialty items not available in their own environment and look good doing it. The popular concept of jewelry as a store of value has continued to this day. In later agricultural civilizations, cattle were often the standard value objects for large transactions and salt for small ones. Salt was rare in those days and valuable. Roman soldiers were paid in salt, 
thus the term salary, meaning payment for services. With the invention of writing, trade in other commodities could be carried out using promises of cattle and salt. The cattle and salt weren't necessarily what was finally delivered. They were just commonly understood units of value in which the real trade goods could be conveniently priced. Written credits were expressed in these two common units, although they represented a variety of real goods and services. This form of money was ideal for local economies, where traders were known to each other and pledges could be collected upon. Agricultural surpluses allowed some people to leave the farming to others and specialize in particular crafts. This resulted in improved skills and better tools and that led to further gains in productivity. This specialization of labor required increased trade as more people opted to produce a single item of enhanced value. They would then need to trade their specialty for the broad spectrum of necessities that past generations had produced for themselves. But direct barter was inefficient, so more trade led to a greater need for money. Over many centuries, various forms of money were tried. Eventually, gold and silver coins proved to be the most useful money objects because they were conveniently portable and similarly valued across large areas of the civilized world. They were also easily standardized for weight and purity and did not require enforcement of value by some authority nor redemption in goods from someone far away. Thus, for very good reasons, gold and silver became the universally successful international currencies accepted as final payment of debt almost everywhere. The problem with a system in which money is a standard commodity is that it is most efficient when only one standard commodity is used. But if you do that, it makes the value of money exclusively dependent on the quantity of that one commodity in relation to all other commodities. For example, the Spanish thought they would be fabulously wealthy with all the gold they stole from the Aztecs and the Incas and then turned into money back home. But when the gold got back to Europe, sure, the amount of gold increased, but it didn't increase real productivity in proportion. Fertilizer would have been more useful for that. So because there was no big increase in real stuff to buy with it, the value of gold decreased and the Spaniards discovered that gold had no absolute money value in itself, as many people had imagined it would. Its value was determined by its abundance relative to the value of real goods and services to be bought. Yet many continue to argue that the value of gold, a luxury item of no practical use to most people, should be the measure of value for all the real goods and services essential to our lives. While some campaign for a return to gold, others mistakenly believe that today's money still does represent gold held in a vault somewhere. That hasn't been true for decades. In our current money system, we use national fiat currencies and bank promises to pay in national currencies as the standard commodity instead of gold. National currencies used to be promises to pay in gold or silver, but way more promises were made than could be honored, so that system fell apart. Today, national currency is just legally enforced money, what they call fiat money. That is, it's money you have to accept because the government says so. To many, this government fiat money is just worthless paper. But is it really? We can pay our taxes with it, and governments, especially local ones, provide essential services paid for with those taxes, like roads, schools, hospitals, libraries, police, and military. So government fiat money isn't worthless at all. 
Now, it is true that consumers of government services have no individual free market choice as to what their tax money is spent on and what services they receive. In fact, many taxpayers may not want those services. So therefore, this money can rightly be accused of being monopolistic, coercive, and socialist. But government is coercive, monopolistic, and socialist by nature, isn't it? What else should it be? Government in a democracy or a republic is ideally a single authority, empowered by society to enforce laws agreed upon by society for its own collective benefit. In a free market economy, government must provide the level playing field of law within which the free market can function and it also has to provide the referees to enforce the rules of the game. Those who are nostalgic for the freedom of the frontier should recall that the first thing early settlers usually did was elect a sheriff and build a jail and collect taxes to pay for both, for good reason. So government fiat money isn't inherently worthless by nature. Governments at all levels offer vital services in exchange for it. It only becomes worthless when government creates too much of it, which it often does, and for the worst reasons. While many reformers are fixated on the differences between gold and fiat currency, what's more important is the essential similarity being single, uniform commodities, gold, silver, national currencies, and bank credit, all share the characteristic common to monies for millennia past. The more money there is, relative to the real things available to buy, the less the money unit is worth. Thus the total quantity of money in circulation is extremely important to maintaining the general price levels. And today, this quantity is largely determined by the demand for new money to purchase real estate and speculative equities. This makes the supply of money for general trade particularly vulnerable to real estate and stock market bubbles. Perhaps the most significant problem with money as a single commodity is its tendency to concentrate wealth. Those who have no money must get it from those who have it to lend. Anyone with extra money can lend it at interest. And if, rather than spending all of the interest, they add any of it to their lending capital, they will accumulate even more money to lend. One reputable study counted all the ways we pay interest directly on our own debt and indirectly in prices and taxes for corporate and government debt. This was compared to the interest we earn from all sources. This study found that only the richest 10% come out ahead. The next 10% do little better than break even and the remaining 80% pay more than they receive, the poorest losing out the most.